Howdy peeps and welcome back to Text in English Poetry Bite Size. Uh, this is uh, section uh, three of this uh, little series and in this we are exploring format of poetry or its form in general uh, in order to apply to our reading list. Um, we've said that poetry is characterized as a, a format by rhyme, um, uh, uh, lemon and lime in time, sublime uh, by rhythm it is characterized um, well let me take a look in those blue blue eyes um, imagery and form um, you can see here in this format as well this wonderful uh, poem uh, visual poem uh, which i haven't actually made sense of yet i'm gonna see what everybody else can make sense out of what's coming uh, in terms of its words and its clusters there, but it's certainly drawing me in. So today let's have a look at um, imagery. And we'll start here with this wonderful uh, alphabetical sort of uh, alphabet text or work, which is a sort of genre of text, uh, miscellany, encyclopedia, some sort of uh, alphabetic collection or classification. E is for emperor penguin. Uh, by Liz Brownlee. Penguins like to stand together, keep him warm by sharing feather. Some in the center hug, some out, all take their turn and turn about. Their layers of feathers form a roof to make them wind and waterproof. They keep their chicks warm on their feet and can recycle body heat. Their bills and flippers small in shape to help stop any heat escape. Penguins sound like trumpets talking and look most comical when walking, but on their stomachs, they can ski over the ice fields to the sea. And when they dive in just like that, they turn clown to, from clown to acrobat. All right, butchered that last line there as well by actually going down the pedder. Uh, and when they dive in, just like that, they turn from clown to acrobat. Um, this makes an image, an image of, a, of, a, of an emperor penguin, and is a good example of a shape or concrete poem. Uh, that's an excellent way of starting with poetry uh, in primary. You can give shapes and just add words to them. Um, you can use glossaries quite freely um, or give multiple choice. Um, uh, you can follow the link there or find Liz Brownlee yourself online. We're going to talk about imagery and imagery is something that we discussed when talking about literature. If you've been following this text in English series, um, we've talked about uh, literal language, sensory or physical description, uh, as well as uh, figurative language. I'm going to start here by having a little look at some uh, ideas about sensory description. Description, poetry and description the two of our very important starter texts in primary when we're building up our literacy. Um, sensory description uh, could be sight, sounds, movement, smell, taste, or touch. And there we've got the posh words for them as well, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, gustatory, and tactile. So let's have an example from uh, Alan Alberg's The Mysteries of Zygmar. Um, some great poetry Alberg has done, love the illustrations here. This is a rather fantastical conceit, a little bit of fantasy literature. Uh, this is called The Slow Man. The phone rings, but never long enough for the slow man. By the time the set switched on, his favorite program's over. His tea grows cold from cup to lip. His soup evaporates. He laughs eventually at jokes long since gone out of fashion. Sell-by dates and limited special offers defeat him. He comes home with yesterday's paper and reads it tomorrow. So I love this little sort of fantastical image of a character known as the slow man. We start off with a, a sound image, quite simple, not developed with too many adjectives, as we know, sort of description relies on adjectival use here. But here we've also got sort of a plot action sort of uh, developing the phone rings. Um, and then we've got the sense of, of time, uh, of movement, never long enough 
because we know the slow man is slow to move. So this is implicit or implied that we get no movement, which is clearly sort of descriptive of the slow man. By the time, all sitting on its own there as well. So we can see already we've got no rhyme rings enough man, phone rings, but never long enough for the slow man, no internal rhymes. Um, uh, the phone rings, but never three, but never long enough five for the slow man four. So we seem to have a higgledy piggledy meter or rhythm as well. By the time the set switched on, set switched on, S sounds, we'll come to alliteration a little bit later. His favorite program's over. Um, his tea grows cold. So we've got this sense of um, both um, heat is really sort of touch, if anything, uh, physical sensation. Um, we've also got maybe the sort of the smell, the ideas of sort of olfactory, gustatory sort of sensations going on here from cup to lip. We've got this movement from cup. Perhaps it's more sort of like this, the, the, the finger out, lovely. Oh, very good, Charles, very good indeed. From cup to lip, his soup evaporates. Very good image, this one as well, when you think about it. Lovely image here as well, the soup evaporating out of the bowl. Um, so we've got this sense of heat dissipating. So we've got a sort of um, a visual sensation here as well. Um, definitely not one of sound. Um, uh, a sort of sense of natural processes in terms of movement uh, uh, and uh, perhaps a little bit in terms of sort of sensation you can imagine sort of like the heat of of the bowl and then sort of the heat evaporating steam uh, coming off it he laughs sound eventually it jokes long since gone out of fashion sell by dates and limited special offers defeat him he comes home with yesterday's paper and reads it tomorrow um, what a wonderful little um, piece of piece of work that is. <laughs> uh, we'll come back to Alan Olberg and more of his work in a minute. We can see we've got, um, let's have a look through there. Uh, we've got some, some sights and sounds, a bit of movement, smell, taste and touch. Pretty much all of those. Not so many striking images and we'll pick those up as we go along through our poems and we'll look for those physical sensory description. We want to include um, some uh, imagery uh, of course, in terms of figurative language and the, the types of things we worked uh, with previously in text uh, in English, uh, we had p potentially fairy tales with fleece was white as snow, um, little Miss Muffet, sort of things like sort of these fairy tale and folklore characters with this very simplistic simile description, uh, simple figurative language. Uh, and that's comparison like or as and we'll be looking for similes, a very good place to start with writing your own language, perhaps if you're doing a list poem or an I am poem, which we'll look at in a minute. Uh, metaphor, in other words, substitution. My love is a rose. Uh, my hero is the sword and shield that defends the kingdom. Uh, these are simple uh, substitutions. And we'll be looking at metaphors, personification, which is when we take an abstract idea, Today, I think it's the moon or the wind or the forest. We'll see which one I've got um, and make that into a person. We've looked at forms of personification before uh, when dealing with um, uh, fairy tales, Gothic and fantasy literature. Um, very common tactic in poetry. Uh, we're also gonna look at the onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia, lovely, lovely rhythm to that onomatopoeia, 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 uh, which is the use of sound, sound which sound words which sound like themselves, and we'll be looking at those. Great fun to start off with poetry and do a bit of sort of uh, onomatopoeic work. And another sound device in terms of imagery is alliteration that we'll look at. So let's look at some poems. Um, Sarah Crossan's collection one uh, is uh, used in sort of years five to seven uh, in, uh, uh, in the UK. Uh, I fell in love with this poem and you can click down there uh, and you can see a performance by Sarah herself. All night, Tippy and I lie with our arms wrapped around each other like rope. I bury my face in her neck and she wakes every now and then to kiss the top of my head 
when the birds begin to sing and the sky turns peachy. We lie looking at each other, our eyes, eyes too tired for tears. Tippy rubs my nose with my own. It's all going to be okay, she says. And even if it's not okay, it really is. Um, poems convey moments, poems convey feelings and emotions. Um, they're an important tool in terms of expression when thinking about health and life skills uh, uh, in teaching in class from primary uh, upwards. And I fell for this poem automatically, uh, straight away. And it's got a striking image. All night, Tippy and I lie with our arms, we're in the present tense, wrapped around each other like rope. Uh, what a fantastic, like means this is a simile. We're saying that uh, them lying together entangled is like a pile of rope. Um, and I think it's a beautiful image. Um, and it seems to convey a lot to me. I'm instantly sold in that first sentence. And I love the fact that we've got no, um, uh, no rhyme. Um, there's no real rhythm. Uh, uh, and the way that the lines, I've actually centered it leaves like rogue on its own in a single line. So it sort of really underlines that first sentence and image, because then we have another long sentence that sort of organizes the rest of the poem. Um, some lovely little moments in it as well. The sky turns peachy. Um, so we've got sight or visual imagery, got that lovely sense of a peachy sky like a peach, and I love that. Um, we've got lots of sort of the birds beginning to sing. We've got sounds. We've got tactile, the kiss to the top of the head. I bury my neck in her face. This is just sensory description. Uh, our, our eyes too tired for tears, too tired for tears. So lovely use of the repetition of T there, which is what we call alliteration. Um, um, and then we sort of have four, three short lines to end it, in, including dialogue. Uh, it's all going to be okay, she says, present tense. And even if it's not, it really is. Quite beautiful. Uh, something I'd recommend using um, and um, ask questions about their relationship and what's going on. Obviously, there's been some kind of um, adversity involved here as well. So Sarah Crossan um, uh, will be getting this collection. Looks wonderful. Um, then we talked about metaphor, where one thing becomes another, and I couldn't resist this. Um, you can click down here to watch the beloved Roger McGough uh, reading from this. Uh, again, very sort of alternative identity. Uh, for me growing up, I remember Roger McGough and his poetry, uh, and he's still active today. Um, uh, so here we've got a whole collection with the main poem, uh, and it's based, as you can see above me, on a metaphor, the poetry is a pie and that fits in very well with what is essentially a sort of visual poem above me here as well with its verbal text and its visual text. Newly baked and fresh today, eat while hot or take away. Poetry pie, poetry pie, straight from the oven our poetry pie, poetry pie, poetry pie, we're all loving our poetry pie. Rhymes and rhythms, raps and riddles, no nonny knows or hey diddle diddles, poetry pie, poetry pie, we can't get enough our poetry pie, poetry pie, poetry pie, loving the stuff in our poetry pie, poems that tickle and trip off the tongue, poems to, to be whispered and shouted and sung, poems that chuckle and poems that bite, poems that moan and go bump in the night, poems that meow and bark and roar, look out, here comes a dinosaur, poetry pie, poetry pie, there's nothing as nice as poetry pie, poetry pie, poetry pie, have a slice of our poetry pie, poems that stand apart from the crowd, poems that will make you laugh out loud, poems that go and jump off the shelf, poems that you'll want to keep to yourself, poems that you'll want to share with a friend, poems that you wish would never end. Poetry pie, poetry pie, sing the song of poetry pie, poetry pie, poetry pie, ning nang nong, it's poetry pie. What a wonderful performative piece. You can see Roger McGough doing it probably better than me because I've, that's the first time I've done that. Um, very rhythmic made to be sung and repeated. Uh, you can imagine a whole class joining in with poetry pie, poetry pie, we can't get enough of our poetry pie. Um, 
something that you could make up your own versions of. It works in parts in different ways, like a list poem. What's a list poem, Charles? We'll be looking at that uh, uh, after in the next section on form as well. Poems, 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 that repetition describing a single object uh, is a, an excellent sort of form um, for writing poetry because um, uh, you can simply write stuff that describes things. Here we've got a strong sense of rhyme all the way through, newly baked and fresh today, eat while well, hot or take away. Poems that tickle and trip off the tongue, poems to be whispered and shouted and sung. Well, good use for your elocution and intonation. Um, so we've got lots going on in here in terms of uh, we've got structured uh, rhythm, we've got rhyme today, away, pi, 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 uh, riddles, diddles, tongue, sung, bite, night. These are all full rhymes, of course, raw, dinosaur, fun, unexpected ones and changes there in the, um, the structure, the form, if you will. Uh, most important is that the whole thing is to say uh, is a metaphor. So we've not got a good example of a single line metaphor here. But what we've got from up there is we've got the overall visual metaphor that poetry is like a pie and it includes all sorts of things. It's newly baked and fresh today, eat while hot or take away. So it starts off with this uh, image and conceit of poetry being a pie fresh out of the oven uh, that gets us to um, really sing because it's a lyrical poem and it's like a song um, with no hey nonny nose and hey diddle diddles um, um, so it's made for performance um, and the whole thing is a pie um, so lovely piece of work there lovely go and look at this wonderful collection um, a great for use in the classroom um, this kind of form makes it quite easy to use in early primary years so we talked about metaphor uh, now we're going to move on. I could have chosen so many poems here, but we're going to talk about personification. <laughs> and here I can see um, the text actually is, oh, it's over there, isn't it? Sorry. The moon at Knoll Hill, it should be the L-E. It's auto-corrected out of this. So sorry, Jackie Kay from her collection, Red Cherry Red. Love that as well. Love the name. Love the illustrations. Look at that beautiful cover there as well. Um, here we've got an example of personification. The moon was married last night and nobody saw, dressed up in a ghostly dress for the summer ball. The stars shimmied in the sky and danced a whirly gig. The moon vowed to be true and lit up the corn rigs. She kissed the dark lips of the sky above the summer house. She, in her pale white dress, swooned across the vast sky. The moon was married last night the beautiful bell of the ball. Nobody saw her at all, except a small girl in a navy dress who witnessed it all. Um, lovely, very poorly read by me, sorry about that. Do go to the link there on Vimeo. That's from um, uh, a resource that I recommend very strongly um, for use of literature and poetry in primary. So they're, they're all there, you'll see it as you go in. <clears throat> I think Jackie reads it a bit better because, of course, the conceit is, is the moon is personified uh, as, um, as a person. Uh, and then we have a witness. Nobody saw her at all except a small girl in a navy dress who witnessed it all. Uh, and uh, the, the little girl is obviously the poet remembering back to somewhere uh, that she lived as a young girl, uh, judging by the fact that it's on a farmhouse, maybe with a corn rigs and a summer ball and a whirly gig, you might think that it was potentially when she lived in the Americas, though I think she is a British poet now, or has obviously moved around. Um, so the moon was married. Obviously, that's a human um, conceit, uh, dressed up in a ghostly dress uh, for the summer ball. The stars shimmied in the sky and danced a whirly gig. The moon vowed to be true and lit up the corn rigs. So we've got gig and gigs, which are a full to half rhyme. Um, she kissed the dark lips of the sky above the summer house. She in a pale white dress swooned across the vast sky. The moon was married last night, the beautiful bell of the ball, and nobody saw it at all. Full rhyme, rhyming couplet there, except a navy girl in a, a, a small girl in a navy dress who witnessed it all back to all as well. So we've got A, A, B, A there at the end at some kind of sort of um, 
rounding up, we can say as well, of that poem there as well. Um, so we've got some elements of rhyme, but regular elements of rhyme, um, no real regular rhythm involved. Uh, we've got lots of physical imagery and description, uh, the ghostly dress, the stars shimmied in the sky, some sort of sense of movement. They danced a whirly gig as well. So we've got an image again. Um, uh, this is all personified. So they're all sort of strong sort of metaphorical images. Um, she kissed the dark lips of the sky. So we've got sort of tactile image of kissing. The dark lips of the sky is a very striking image as well. Does the sky have lips? They would you'd definitely be lost in them. Maybe a bit like mine. Mm. Um, so we've got lots of physical sounds. We've got sights, movement with swooning and shimmying. Um, we've got a bit of alliteration, the beautiful bell of the bull, uh, which is a sort of um, very sort of common uh, idiomatic bit of speech. Uh, and then we've got this contrast between the girl in the sky who's being married, who's potentially the older self, uh, being envisaged to grow up or in a fantasy from this small girl who's the witness. Lovely. Do check out Jackie Kay. I certainly will be. And let's move on now, uh, before this becomes too long a session, to Michael Rosen, the wonderful Michael Rosen, um, who I know will be in your uh, reading lists. This is from his collection, A Great Big Cuddle. Um, and um, like poems for the very young, so a really good starting point. And you can see the illustrations there on that side. Sorry, Chris Riddell, um, uh, excellent, known for illustrating Neil Gaiman's works, for example, among others. And this is a sort of fantasy. We don't see the images uh, of um, the Gom, the Flom, and a Chum, um, but we're looking here as well at the use of sort of sound, uh, particularly onomatopoeia. Um, uh, which uh, appears in this poem called Once. Once there was a plum, there lived, uh, once upon a plum, there lived a poor little mom, along with her children free. There was a great big gom, a flom and a chom, who all sang, me, me, me. Then the flom said, ping, and the chom said, ting, and the gom said, ping pong pee. And the poor little mum said to the gom, what about me, me, me? Now along came a bearable. This bearable was terrible. It roared like the stormy sea. Out the way gone, the flom and the chum. Your mom is dinner for me. You can't eat mom, said the great big gom. Oh no, they said all three. So they got up the bearable. It tasted really terrible. Now they're happy, as happy can be. Um, lovely, not potentially the best example of onomatopoeia. I could think of Michael Rosen's going on a bear hunt as a very good example of onomatopoeia. I hope you all know that. If you don't, then go and get it immediately. Uh, but here we've got sort of um, the gom, the flum and the charm um, that are sort of really put in just to rhyme with mom, which is an unusual usage, sort of Americanism. I read it in a sort of estuary English kind of accent, like once upon a plum, they lived like a, li a poor little mom. Um, we've got, they say, ping and ting, ping pong pee, what about me, 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 and the uh, name of the character there, bearable, which was terrible, which I sort of fluffed up slightly at the end there as well. So lots of plays with sound. Um, you can see it set up a little bit like um, uh, a rhyme, uh, a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale with repetition. Um, we can think of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears potentially in this sort of uh, situation with the numbering as well. Um, there's obviously some rhyme, plom, mom, um, gom, chum, uh, and then uh, so we've got a, a, plom, mom, three, gom, chum, me, me, me. So we've got a, a, b, a, a, b, a, a, b, a, a, b. So we've got a regular rhyme scheme all the way through. Now along came a berry bull. This berry bull was terrible, eight, eight. It roared like the stormy sea, seven. Um, so we've got some sort of bits of sort of regular rhyme, but it's not a strict regular rhyme, um, rhythm all the way through, so rhythm or meter. Stormy sea, sissa, bit of alliteration. Uh, and in terms of uh, imagery, um, 
actually don't have a, a great deal. We've got the stormy sea, the roaring with the sounds, uh, and um, we haven't really got anything else that's uh, more figurative, perhaps uh, showing that this is intended for years one to two in UK primary. Okay, so that's a little look at some onomatopoeic sound elements. Let's have a look at um, alliteration, uh, which is very important. And we've already pointed out stormy seas we had there as well. Let's go back to Roger McGough, the Midnight Skaters from his excellent collection, All the Best. <clears throat> um, you can, um, can read Rog uh, or listen to Rog saying it as well, probably much better than me as he wrote it and knows it. Uh, let's have a little look. Uh, it's midnight in the ice rink, and all is cool and still. Darkness seems to hold its breath. Nothing moves until, out of the kitchen, one by one, the couple comes creeping, quiet as mice to the brink of the ice, while all the world is sleeping. Then suddenly a serving spoon switches on the light, and the silver swoops upon the ice, screaming with delight. The knives are high-speed skaters, round and round they race, blades hissing, sissing, whizzing at a dizzy pace. Forks twirl like dancers, pirouetting on the spot. Teaspoons, who take no chances, hold hands and giggle a lot. All night long the fun goes on, until the sun, their friend, gives the warning signal that all good things must end. So they slink back to the darkness of the curly kitchen cutlery drawer and steel themselves to wait until it's time to skate once more. At eight, the canteen ladies breeze in as good as gold to lay the tables and wonder why the cutlery is so cold. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Love that. Again, didn't read it very well. Sorry about that. Too much pressure uh, video recording. <laughs> Um, so we, we end up there just going backwards as well. Lovely cutlery is cold, alliteration, good as gold, alliteration with a simile there, as good as gold, a bit of a cliched uh, simile there as well. Um, <clears throat> it's got regular um, rhythm or meter, as you probably noticed from my reading. Um, we've got a regular rhyme pattern as well, or scheme, as you can see there as well. They're sometimes unexpected, rink, sink, breath, until one creeping of the ice and sleeping. So we've got um, AA, start, hold its breath, nothing moves until, out of the kitchen one by one, the cutlery comes creeping, quiet as mice to the brink of the ice, internal rhyme while all the world is sleeping. So creeping and sleeping, full rhyme there as well. Um, so we've got A, A, B, C, D, E, F, E. Um, so we've got sort of, um, not an obvious, but sort of it comes back to um, uh, uh, a sort of stricter rhyme with an alternating, or alternating rhyme and couplet there towards the end of that section, though it's all one piece, of course. Um, we've got the silver swoops. Let's have a look. All is cool and still. Darkness seems to hold its breath. Nothing moves until, still until. Sorry, there's the rhyme there as well. Um, uh, we've got cool and still, darkness seems to hold its breath. You can hear within it as well, the S sounds all the way through with ice rink as well to produce this, what's called, actually called assonance because it's sort of internal sort of rhymes. We could talk about alliteration as well here. The cutlery comes creeping. K, 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 perfect example of alliteration there. A repeated K sound, quiet as mice to the brink of the ice. Internal rhyme with mice and ice while all the world is sleeping. And again, that sort of return to the ice and the S sounds all the way through. Then suddenly a serving spoon, suddenly a serving spoon, a three point alliteration there, switches on the light, so it continues. And the swilver, silver swoops upon the ice, screaming with delight. So we've got a constant use of alliteration, high speed skaters. The knives are high speed scouters. Round and round they race, round and round they race, ah, ah, ah. Blades hissing, sissing, whizzing at a dizzy pace. That's called assonance because it's an internal to the words repeated sounds as well. So very strong in terms of sound, this poem. Um, got some lovely images as well. We've got moments of both um, physical and sensory description. Uh, sounds like darkness holding its breath, uh, the creeping, the hissing, the sissing and the whizzing. A lovely examples of onomatopoeia there as well. Blades hissing, sissing, and whizzing at a dizzy pace. Uh, they actually sound like the, uh, the actions themselves. Um, so we've got loads going on in this uh, poem in terms of uh, rhyme. 
in terms of rhythm, in terms of Im imagery and sensory sort of uh, literal uh, sensory description. Uh, we've got images, um, we've got some similes in there, but quiet as mice, <coughs> that's also a simile as well. Uh, and we've got um, uh, use of onomatopoeia and alliteration as well. So this has really got it all going on in here, uh, which is why Roger McGough is such a well um, uh, received and loved poet. That's all from me. Uh, we've been text in English. It's up there. Don't get it wrong. Poetry here in 2022. Stay safe. <laughs>